Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Jonathan Last, sitting in for your regular host, the great Charlie Sykes. I am joined today by an old, old, old friend of mine. Uh, not meaning that he's old, but just that we've been together for forever. Uh, li- literally old. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> literally old. The great Mike Murphy, who uh, is one of the... I mean, well, one of the smartest guys, but whatever. The smart guys are a dime a dozen in Washington. Uh, one of the best guys I've ever met in in my DC time. And uh, Mike, it is great to have you on the show again. Well, you're in thank LA you, now. My you made it out. You you escaped from DC. You did. It. I I fled to run the Schwarzenegger campaign in 2003, and I looked around, and I said, "The weather's nice, 340 days a year." There's socialism, but that seems to be on the march everywhere. So net net, it's a winner. Met a girl, married her. Uh, had a daughter, and I now live in Los Angeles, California, except when we slip away to New Hampshire in the summer. That is awesome. Uh, so let's get right to to what's going on here in D.C. this week, which is maybe Char- Charlie said in his newsletter this morning, green shoots for centrism. <laughs> I So here's here's what we've had this week. We have the outline of an infrastructure bill compromise. We have Joe Manchin putting forth a skinny voting rights bill, which is good enough to have gotten Stacey Abrams on board within like four minutes. We have a bipartisan passing and regular order of the creation of Juneteenth as a federal holiday. And we have two Supreme Court opinions, which don't really make anybody very upset. Yeah. Yeah. It's unbelievable. I So what does that now? So Charlie and, and Crystal are Sykes and Crystal are like, yes, this is our bipartisan, no labels future. And I look at this and I just think you guys are Lucy with a football. Who's right? <laughs> Well, you you to uh, much affection from me. Uh, I don't know if you're Irish, but you you have the Irish outlook of yes, there's a green shoot, but there's also a huge giant lawnmower coming uh, because <laughs> that is life, and we're screwed, and we live in a in a tawdry one ring circus of politics where it's very hard for anything good to happen in the modern era. Long term, I'm a little more optimistic. So what what do I think? I I'm not quite in the little crystal sunshine. Uh, area on hacks on tap they always call me little murphy uh, sunshine so i'm gonna pass that moniker on to bill but no i think i think the infrastructure thing has a better chance to happen than not does that mean it's all changed no i think it might be it might kind of be like the famous christmas story in world war ii where the two sides stop killing each other and go out and 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 kind of talk like humans for two hours and then go back to the slaughter the next day uh, the reason i think it may happen on the infrastructure side is there are enough senators who are sane, I believe, to get to that magic 60 point and then stop probably in both parties and understand that one with super low interest rates, borrowing a trillion dollars for capital spending, you know, bridge, port, electricity, water helps make our economy more competitive. It's a money maker, helps us compete in the world economy. So policy wise, it's a really good move. Now, I don't know if they can spend it appropriately. I know there are going to be all kinds of steam towns at the end, but fundamentally, net net, it is a good move forward. And I think they also understand that getting something real nine to five lunch pail infrastructure bill serious business done for the country in a non-tribal massacre way would be a really really good thing a real restart the problem we have is of course with humans as always and i'll I'll be quick here because i can ramble on forever about this kind of stuff the problem is the human greed. You know, the Democrats cannot take the mission of, hey, why don't we rebuild normalcy? No, no, no. They've, they've got to go do the New Deal or go spend one and a half times the cost of World War II and adjusted dollars. You know, it, and that greed is, political greed is a problem. The infrastructure bill is a huge win for the country, not ideologically, just functionally, and to show the world we can function again. And I, I think they ought to grab that thing and do it. $1.2 trillion is a great number. It's historical. And just put the political ideological greed aside and and score one for the the, the system. And I, I think in the end they will. Uh, so I'm I uh, I'm short on this bill. And in, in terms of you're its, short on everything, though, I you're, am you're, short on everything. I'm short you're, on America. You ever seen the movie The Cooler with Bill Macy? I'm sure you <laughs> have. Exactly. I am Bill you, Macy. You, you, you walk movie. by the by the crap table and everybody gets wiped out. Yeah. But you uh, might be right. You've been right so far, I will say. 
So what, what just what are the incentives for Republicans to go along with this? You know, um, there everything's fine now. You've got your, you know, however many Republicans who are, you know, signed on in theory. But we are one Trump press release away from. Can you believe these rhinos helping socialist sleepy Joe Biden with the worst deal in the history of hugeness? Right. right? right and right. and then these guys are going to run for the hills. Well, that'll be the test. I think the pressure on them, some will have civic purpose. That'll be a single digit number. (laughs) Uh, Maybe, maybe we'll get to get to high single digits there. Remember in the, in the world that politicians exist in, even Republican politicians in the, in the external world. Yeah. You worry about your crazy primary voters wearing uncle Sam suits and waiting for the magnum mega bulletins from crazy town. But you also have the the kind of micro politician world where, where they spend their time all day with the big economic and labor interest of their state, other politicians and every county commissioner and mayor and suburban Republican state rep and, and, you know, the whole armada of the system they swim around in and bump into every day are screaming at them for the infrastructure money. That's why historically the feds have liked to do this kind of thing. You know, their big employers are. I mean, here in California, you know, we've got all kinds of problems with our ports, which means our our huge critical ports are going to start, that share is going to be taken away as the Chinese fund new ports in Mexico. So the in the inside game, the pressure to open the checkbook and do something is, is tremendous. So they're, they're going to be torn. And I think the 11 who've signed on to the bipartisan thing, at least initially, they know there's MAGA trouble coming. Um, they're, you know, they're not fools about that. And I think on this one, uh, they if, if, if they kill off all the, and I'll, I'll use pejorative Republican campaign hack terms here, if they kill off all the welfare stuff that Biden wanted to jam up the bill with in the beginning and make it mostly pouring concrete, I think it's pretty defensible. And I don't think all of them will fold. We only need 10 here. And uh, I think there's a fighting chance. But you're right. It, the Trump bleat uh, will have an impact and we'll see. This this will be a wonderful lab test of are there I 10 who will put the country ahead of MAGA? So because this is, you know, political incentives have changed. Part of it is what you see. You know, we have two senators who are misaligned from the presidential preferences of their state. Uh, right. I think there's only two left nationally, Manchin and Collins. Right. Um, and I saw a poll last week asking, I think it was Missouri, Missouri primary voters. And they said, you know, what do you want out of your next senator? Do you want somebody who is going to look out for Missouri and bring home the bacon and blah, 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 blah. Uh, or do you want somebody who's going to go to Washington and fight Joe Biden to stop his his agenda? And it was 60, 30 fight Joe Biden. (laughs) Yeah, no, no, no. But keep in mind, I've got to say, all true, but primary voters are a little more fungible than people think. You know, they they take a second out of the day to opine and they generally do the tribal noise. Now, now, by the way, I'm surprised that it wasn't 80 percent murder Joe Biden, burn him (laughs) at the cross. And so you, you always look at the number minus 50. So they're 10 points above breaking even on it. There's some interesting Fabrizio data, the Republican poster, Tony Fabrizio, who, who worked for Trump. Uh, we had him on Hacks on Tap a month ago or so, maybe a little longer, and he had done a big primary poll of, of those voters. And really, you look at the Trump thing, it, it's not the monolith people think. You, you've got a plurality that's all Trump all the time. But then you've got a majority that's either hate Trump, smaller group, yeah, uh, you know, he's OK, but I'm not so sure. Or, yeah, he's wonderful, but uh, let's move on. And so I think the, you know, politics, as you know, runs on anecdotal information. These guys in the cloakroom telling each other, God, at my town hall, the red hats ate me alive because I, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, oh, they all get worked up. But then there's a defining event. We all remember this. Well, we probably don't all remember, but being, uh, as your kind introduction indicated, uh, Jurassic, I remember the Harris Wofford special in Pennsylvania in the early 90s where, where it was an upset. And he talked about health care. That means the whole national political agenda has got to be health care. And then it was health care. Um, so these anecdotal things can start a big ball rolling. If the Trump world does not massacre next summer and spring, a bunch of these, uh, Liz Cheney's 
Anthony Gonzalez, Catco up in New York, John Catco, uh, Fred Upton in Michigan, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Kinzinger, if he still has a district, if if they survive their primaries, and I think a bunch of them will be able to. Then the anecdotal thing, wow, Trump's ray gun isn't as big as we thought. You know, we just haven't had that mark to market moment yet. and We won't for a while. So I I think some of these folks are overstating the actual on the ground impact of the of the MAGA stuff. But to your point, it still doesn't mean they won't be cowed by it and act that way until something realigns their thinking. So yeah. this will be the test. I, I agree with you about that. Well, we're going to I actually want to spend some time talking about Gonzalez in Ohio in a minute. But before we do that, so let's move from the infrastructure to the Manchin voting rights bill. Uh, Manchin comes out with what seems to be an awfully sensible voting rights bill, something that addresses basically, you know, you break apart the individual components of it. And I suspect every single thing in it pulls over 65 percent. Uh, people want voter ID of some sort, and Manchin does voter ID in a way that is uh, straight shooting and not designed to, you know, actually suppress min- minorities and, and old people. Uh, they like, really, really like having Election Day be a federal holiday. They like being able to do early voting. They like they like all the things. Um, and Stacey Abrams jumps out very early and. I think very, very helpfully to keep the progressives on side on this. Uh, And Mitch McConnell rushes out at emergency press conferences and basically just vomits out a bunch of words that, that sound like uh, conservative bingo. You know, he says, (laughs) he he says, this is more cancel culture, first amendment. uh, And then he says, you know, then he blames computers. You know, he says, we don't want to let the computer, I mean, (laughs) Things yeah, which yeah, I agree. It was word uh, salad, and uh, so what's going to happen here with with voting rights? Mansion has well, it's dead. Um, I, I, look, one, I applaud Mansion. Uh, two, I thought the Abrams thing was an interesting tell. She is a smart Paul. She and sure is, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So keep an eye on her. I, I, I often say, and I'm often ridiculed, but I would not be surprised if she primaries Harris. Um, who keeps stumbling and doesn't have some of the campaign chops that I think uh, uh, conventional wisdom assumes she has. But if you look back, it's been stumble, stumble, single home run, single stumble, stumble. It's uneven with with uh, Vice President Harris. But anyway, to to the bill, you know, I I, I kind of a, I double agree with Manchin. On one hand, I I, I like his move here. And he he made a horrible bill much better and essentially palatable. And two, he he has a secondary critique, he says, which is I'm generally not in favor of changing election procedure rules on a completely partisan basis because that only increases the division. And he's been scoffed at by the progressives for that. But he's right. He's right. I mean, the Republicans have set this awful precedent of going down and screwing around with election bills in Georgia and a really bad one bubbling in Texas. Now, caveat, it's not quite the the Jim Crow stuff that Democrats have politically reacted to sensing a huge win. But morally, it is a step backwards. And I think the Georgia thing was done in bad faith. So I'll, I did and I will continue to condemn it. Uh, and there are other bills around the country that are worse or some that are aren't that terrible. But fundamentally, Republicans have started screwing around on a partisan basis in the states. And I don't really think the answer is, okay, let's federalize the crime from the other side, which is why a mansion type bill is so important. Because we could on a bipartisan basis, if anybody had any uh, uh, any civic purpose, pass something like that and, and help reinforce the overall democracy franchise, which I think to you and to me and our, our compatriots is really like um, important. And, you know, McConnell checked out of that. And right now the Democrats, excuse me, the Republicans are treating it like a totally partisan power grab, which the Manchin version is not. And they're, they're going to vote it down. I don't think there are a noble 11. I think a few will. Uh, but it, it is a yet another low point for our beloved Republican Party. So what does this do to Manchin himself with his filibuster stance? Well, he could, you know, we could get to the old vaudeville thing of uh, Niagara Falls. Slowly I turn step by step and maybe Manchin starts looking at something that was bandied about before, which is kind of the conditional filibuster override special case deal. 
Uh, and I think Manchin, he hasn't said it, but by proposing a reasonable compromise and then having Mitch, you know, do his Genghis Khan act on it, um, it, it, I would think the smart mansion watchers and the GOP would think we're cornering them, boys. Think about that. Um, you know, we ought to be nice to our our savior here. And so ah, that could be the next chapter. We're going to have some test votes, I guess, coming. And I wouldn't be surprised in the next 48 hours if Manchin doesn't say, wow, we might have to put the filibuster aside briefly to do something like this which will be quite a shot across the bow. I, you know, it's weird. I don't normally see McConnell make dumb moves. And, and I thought his antagonistic reaction to Manchin's bill was, was a dumb move. Uh, well, see, I don't, I don't. Because I think it that. isolates Manchin is my point, And that is not in the Republican interest on everything else. Well, except that I mean, the, the Republican interest here is to just assume that Manchin is going to hold firm. And if Manchin is going to hold firm, then you've got to object to everything, right? Yeah, because my, Manchin my, my, my view, though, is if I've learned in 30 years of politics, never bet on a politician to relentlessly hold firm in all situations. Yeah, no, that no. is a that's a Mark's bet. That's fair. I, I, I mean, when I look at this, if you are a Democratic strategist, why would what is the argument against going full Vox? Right. So, you know, we'll reform the filibuster, add D.C. as a state, maybe even reform the SCOTUS after, you know, after having Mitch McConnell say that it's entirely possible that he would not hold a vote on a uh, 2023 Supreme Court nominee, <laughs> which is the most insane thing ever. Uh, as a there, there are moral and civic reasons not to play pure constitutional hardball. But if you're the Democrats, what what is the political downside of any of this because my oh well there's not i mean you know you always appeal to the mob and the democratic mob doesn't want to filibuster but i think my inside ball strategy would be look we got to pry manson loose from the republicans and if he decides not to run again which may be where he's leaning let him walk the plank with us so how do we yeah. how do we and get break dc off as manson? a state and, right so this is, I mean, this is what right. i'm saying you you got to break him off so that you can then add dc this well, yeah, yeah. But you got to be careful about adding the state. You know, there was a period in American history where we did a lot of that. North and South Dakota were not a natural thing. And so if the, we get this, if, if they start minting senators that way, then California can become two states and we can carve out Fresno in the valley and create two more senators there. It becomes an arms race. and It's happened before. So I think the D.C. thing, short term, I get it. Uh, long term, uh, I think they're going to we're going to have 19 states made out of, you know, Utah. Uh, so I'm not sure that's so smart. But if they can tactically isolate Manchin, then they get him for what they really need ideologically, which is all this New Deal 2.0 stuff they want to try to do on reconciliation next. You know, no. where they still don't have him on all that all that budget stuff. So I would I would try to drive a wedge. I would take Manchin's bill, endorse it, pass it, fail, raise holy hell. Uh, in bitter mansion, and then you know, wheel around and start spending money and see if you can move them there, and maybe even get them on some more aggressive filibuster thing. What uh, I mean, I think McConnell is putting mansion more in play than he ought to for a dumb reason that has no moral standing at all, in fact, has moral standing against it. So he's making kind of the cynical evil ploy and the one that I think is shameful for no political gain. I think, I think he's put himself in a more vulnerable position. Well, but this is—I mean, this is what the Republican Party has become. This is yeah. this is a party which no longer looks at politics as a how do I get to fifty plus one. They they have they have abandoned that, and they've abandoned it without even even pretending to not have abandoned it. They now look at the world of you know how can we get power with forty four percent or forty six percent. No, it's That's, become a catalog business. Uh they have a small group of ardent shoppers and they only care about them and now they're they're totally in the uh yeah, I call it no, the junkyard dog theory of politics, bark at everything. It is fully, you know, they their only their only real imperative is to preserve institutional leverage which allows them to hold minority power. I mean that's But I would add a caveat to that. I think that strategy is is illuminated by two 
anecdotally driven beliefs that are real as gravity to them, and they may be disproven going forward. One belief is Trump has a big faucet down there in the zebra-coated bathroom that he can turn on or off the Trump vote for Republicans. So if Trump says stay home, they're all going to stay home. That theory has never worked in politics. People forget that these Trump voters, many, not all, but many of them used to be called Republican primary voters, and they threw the lever for a lot of candidates, including Mitt Romney, who is now, now the great villain. So I'm not sure Trump, they think, though, that Trump can say, stay home and they lose every election. So Trump has a doomsday weapon that they're terrified of. And they're afraid of primaries, that Trump can go nuke them. If they didn't believe those two things, they would be acting differently. So that's why the midterm election primaries are so important, because I think I think some of those beliefs might be shaken. And Trump will evolve. The only rule in politics is everything's always evolving. You don't know the direction. You don't know the rate. But we'll see if the Trump gold standard of today is the Trump gold standard of next March. And uh, the primaries are going to be the measuring stick that the politicians in the Republican universe are going to watch. And what they do will will create the new reality one way or the other. So let's let's talk about that. The primary season begins in earnest uh, in just a, a week or two on June 26th when former President Donald J. Trump journeys to Wellington, Ohio, to the grand old Lorain County Fairgrounds, uh, where he will hold a Save America rally in support of Max Miller, who is launching a primary challenge against uh, Anthony Gonzalez, who voted for impeachment, too. And uh this is, I mean, the whole thing is weird because, as you say, Ohio's losing a district. You know, maybe this this seat, the Ohio 16 seat, doesn't exist. Maybe Kinzinger's seat doesn't exist. Ohio also has a new redistricting reform, which is not entirely nonpartisan, but is kind of nonpartisan, mm-hmm. uh, and which is going to make it a lot harder for the the R's in Ohio to. I think it's. 12-4 is, is how they have uh, the balance now. I think it's going to be harder for them to do that. Um, so what what should we look for? I mean, what, what, what do we think this is even going to look like? You know, is it going to be 4,000 people who show up or, or 25,000? Is, uh, is he going to be together in what's the Latin phrase, you know, compass mentis, you know, like, <laughs> or. no, no, I, I think it'll be one. It'll be what it always is. Trump can put on a nice show and get a nice show crowd, you know, in a primary where you may have 60,000 voters, 4,000 people in a metal shed is interesting, but it's more interesting to the press that wants to put on Jod Purs and, you know, Stanley and Livingston outfits and go explore the scary world of the red States and the Republican party. Um, I, I think it'll be subpar in terms of turnout and everything compared to a presidential rally simply because he isn't president, but it'll be an impact the, the problem for old Max, the Trumpy guy running against Gonzalez is one Gonzalez is tough. I played in the NFL. He was a star at Ohio state and he's fast on his feet. He's going to be w- well-funded. So he ain't no pushover. And second, he's got good district connections. Um, our friend Frank Lavin is helping Gonzalez. You know, Frank worked in the Reagan political office. I mean, he's hardly a left wing radical. Gonzalez is a good Republican conservative and an up and coming star. Second, when when you, when you're the primary opponent, you got Trump helping you. You also have the overhead of Trump helping you. Uh, so in the future, if he does a lot of visits there, it's a big expensive thing that a struggling primary campaign to fund Trump's vanity will be draining Miller's uh, coffers because there's limits to how much of it a Trump pack or whatever can pay once once Miller's a announced candidate. So I, again, the, I like it right now. It's invincible. Trump plans to steamroll, you know, Mary Cheney, Miller, Upton. You can go down the list of the uh, uh, Jamie Herrera, Butler, uh, all the all the Trump villains, and uh, in Trump's mind, and he'll uh, we'll find out. Now, short term though, I think he'll just throw a fit. It'll be, I hate McConnell, I hate the infrastructure deal, I hate Gonzalez. You know, he'll just do Trump grievance. Because apparently, not surprisingly, the reports are he's running around Mar-a-Lago with kind of, I'm, I kept joking a year ago, he'd build a fake Oval Office and just announce he's still president down there and have a couple of yes men, you know, find some guy thrown out of the Air Force as a major to give him secret security briefings and just live a fantasy world of a madman. And I, I think the speech will reflect that mentality. Well, so what I mean, this what the speech could do, especially when, it, you know, whenever you have him just vamping, 
we could get official Trump policy, right? I mean, he could he could set the Trump line against the infrastructure bill. Yeah, right, oh, yeah, way, yeah, probably will know. try. And so if he does that, all of a sudden, then you're going to have a bunch of uh, Republicans scared of, well, you know, how do I get on the other side? So when you look at, you know, I, I look again, so this district is going to change this Ohio 16. Trump ran 12 points behind Gonzalez. In, yeah. in 2020. Uh, it's it's 93 percent white. I mean, I don't even quite know what to make of a district like this when you say, you know, can can a, a guy who is running 12 points ahead of Trump be beaten in a prime, a, a Trump focused primary that is about nothing other than Donald Trump trying to knock him off? Like what? Well, the question is on the ground there. Will it be about Trump trying to knock it off or will Gonzalez say, look, you know, president, I disagree on uh, uh, the former president, but let's move on. Here's what I want to do. I want to stop the big spending. I want to get jobs here. Uh, I would like to make the steel for uh, 20,000 miles of railroad track here uh, in, in our factories, et cetera, et cetera. And, and Gonzalez ought to go on offense about a bunch of that stuff and kind of treat Trump like the rearview mirror, which is where, again, a majority of the Republican primary voters in that Fabrizio data think Trump ought to be. So if Gonzalez is, is clever about this, uh, he can make Trump the crazy old uncle ranting and raving and move the race. Now, the national media coverage will all be Trump all the time. They're in the Trump business to their discredit, though I will I will say they've been good at not overcovering him since he's been president. I've been pleasantly surprised by that. But, uh, you know, Gonzalez has his half of the orchestra here, and he doesn't have to be, yeah, I hate Donald Trump. Let's vote about that. That's not as good yeah. of a race of, I fit here, I'm a conservative, let's move on. Well, this is the real question, right? Is everything nationalized or not? And can right. you, Generally, can locally you it's run? not, but the press is always nationalized because that they think their role is to inform the conversation of Beltway dinner parties. So when you when you look at then the, the 2022 results, what – what are good what would good results be for Democrats? What would good results be for Trump? And what would good results what, good? What what results do you think are going to influence the the chances of him running again in 2024? Well, I think the best thing, obviously, for Democrats would be to hold the House, which will be tough. And as far as because that would more further discredit Trump as a as a you know, anchor around the neck of any hope of conservative Republican governance. But in the primaries, uh, the, the best thing, frankly, is to show that a majority of the people on Trump's death list survived their primaries, maybe a strong majority. I mean, if most of the 10 uh, can get reelected, which I think is totally possible, then all of a sudden the Trump, Trump ray gun, you know, can warm up a hot dog, but it can't kill you. That will be a huge, huge change in, in temperament among about half the Republican House conference. The other half are long gone. Uh, and the senators will feel that. So I think the story can't be Trump avenges. The story has to be uh, Trump has no teeth. And that'll be that is the best thing for both the party and the worst thing for Trump. What is and Kevin McCarthy? And by the way, you know who's that? you know who's hoping for that more than anybody <laughs> who's not on the ballot McCarthy. is McConnell. Yeah, McConnell, McCarthy. So what 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 are these guys going to do about this, right? I mean, the official position of parties is always that uh, we support our incumbents. And do you have I, am I incorrect in thinking that this is an just simply something that has never happened to have a former president running around the country trying to primary members of his own party? I mean, uh, you know, I'm trying to think. There might have been one case, or you know, uh, there was a few kind of earlier versions of uh, the Steve Kings of the world who are outliers, but nothing like this. No, no. Where Jerry Ford leaves the presidency and goes on a jihad in his own party. Uh, right. And, you know, it is the, the committee is always supporting incumbents. The question is how much. But the truth is what they say publicly is not important. It's whether or not what they do directing PAC money and major donors. My guess is there will be a rump group in the House who will make a lot of stink about the NRCC supporting the Gonzaleses of the world. Uh, and that'll be internal Republican uh, politics. The dissident factor will go public because they want the Fox machine to applaud it. So that'll become a tempest in the teapot uh, in the Kremlinology of, of GOP stuff. But on the ground, um, I think 
it'll be the incumbents will raise money. I think the committee will quietly help with that. Uh, and, you know, McConnell's got his own operation, which in some of these Senate primaries may may stand up against Trump. Uh, and so we're see Trump's got the persona, but the machinery and the money, if the candidates are good and can be amplified uh, by people who don't want Trump to dominate the primaries, including McConnell, uh, will be there quietly working with with a lot of muscularity, I think. What, I mean, can you can can these guys, the especially the Trump backed ones, can they just overcome all of the money problems with small dollar? Right. I mean, well, you, look at, try. you look at the amount of money that Josh Hawley raised when he you know, yeah. got into trouble for five minutes. And, you know, I, I just wonder if small dollar money is, you know, apes strong together. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, the, the Internet's democratized fundraising. So it used to be direct mail. The anti-establishment candidates often, if they were well known enough, would raise significant gross money. There just wasn't a lot of net money because the cost of direct mail fundraising for low dollar is so high. This time with the internet, it's not quite as much, but there are no shortage of thieves to get in the middle to profit. I mean, here in California, we have this comedy candidacy of uh, Caitlyn Jenner, which is mostly a national direct mail campaign to enrich a bunch of Trump grifters who latched on to her like barnacles. It, it was never a real campaign because being positioned as a Trump person kills you in California. But they're, 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 they're not destroying Newsom. They're just, you know, cashing in on her. So... These these campaigns that could have some low dollar fundraising ability often can get grifted out of a bunch of the money. But your fundamental point is right. They're, they're going to have some money. I mean, you know, they will they will have enough to be be known. They'll get plenty of earned media. So it won't purely be an auction. But everybody who's already an incumbent fighting off one of these people will have resources. And I think enough. I mean, and, you know, Mary Cheney will be loaded. She's in a fun situation. People, you know, who aren't political nerds like us to understand it's it's not a the Trump people, you know, the brain trust allegedly um, fired up all 82 IQ points and went out and tried to tell the Wyoming legislature to make Cheney's race a majority required race. And it's not. It's a plurality. And they failed. So. You know, when she was first elected in, in Wyoming, I think she won with like 40 percent or 39 percent of the vote. Uh, and we could be back to that world because one great thing about the Trump land is there's always an internal squabble about who's the Trumpiest of all. So my guess is she'll have at least two people. There would be a main Trumper endorsed. And then there'd be a, a rogue rump Trumper saying, oh, I'm the real Trumper here. And, you know, that that may allow her to to prevail with 40% or 42% of the vote, 43, uh, instead of needing to get to 50. That's very interesting. So what do you, what do you think? I mean, the, 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 the big question I, I think in American politics is, does he run again or not? Right. And nothing, nobody in the Republican party can really move on, uh, until they get an answer to that question. I move on. I mean, just move ahead to whatever the next phase yeah, is. Yeah. Well, with certainty, they cases. can't move ahead because Trump will play right. bluff poker. I may run any minute. I'm thinking about it. I right. just got called. Can't tell you who, but 11 world leaders called begging me to run. Um, he has to do that it, all the, he has to do that all the way out because otherwise right. he's not relevant. And this is like his right. means of production. And I've always thought, and I've said for the last couple of years, that he will definitely do that. I My gut was he won't run again, but he'll tease it to have influence and relevance endlessly. Um, and, you know, then he'll tease his endorsement. I'm not, Maybe I'll support the Democrat because um, he's desperate to be relevant. Now, uh, so I don't know how to handicap it. I was intrigued just in terms of the uh, the literature of the apocalypse in this idea that Trump would go pick up a Republican congressional district somewhere and go try to be speaker if we win the majority, you know, take over the conference, which if life imitates art, that of course is the route because that's the craziest thing. And it would be true to kind of try, and he could do that. He could go pick up a congressional seat and then try to run for leadership in the caucus. And I, I, my guess is they'd edge him out, but it would be a real, that would be, it would be an Aaron Allen Drury novel. Um, but and he's talked about that. Some radio kook thought of it, and of course Trump latched onto it. But putting that madness aside, um, I think he's most afraid of losing and downside protection. So he'll make a lot of noise, but ultimately, my guess is he won't. He won't run. Particularly if a year from now he is in more legal trouble, and again 
his super Trump potency is disproven in the midterms when he can't even go knock off a of Fred Upton in Michigan. See, I, 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 I was for a long time kind of where you are. Well, you know, he'll tease it, but then he won't run. Uh, but I think that what happened post November three uh, or November six, whatever election day was, where he managed to convince. 60 to 70 percent of the Republican Party that actually he won, that has eliminated his downside. You know, like his his he is so hedged in another race that he can run and, you know, he'll just say he won afterwards. And all the people who matter will will say not along. Yes, absolutely. Mr. President can't believe that it is to us again. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Could be. He's credited in a world where there is no losing for him. Yeah. But, you know, I think it's just a universal rule of show business, which Trump understands with his kind of animal cunning, that sequels are rarely as good. It's spent. What's new about it? Uh, so while it would be indulgent for him, he could go run a campaign all about his grievances. There's not the same energy or wonder there. They're not the political scientists explaining that, oh, breathlessly, this is the new reality. American politics is fascinating. Trump-like thing. My analog for Trump has always been Jesse Ventura which is, you know, phase one can't win. Phase two, amazing upset. Phase three, politics has been reinvented. You know, phase four, incompetent governor, personal feuds becomes boring. Phase five, fade to, to loss, defeat, and despair. So the, the Trump story has kind of been told in the, in the arc of it all. And I'm not sure what, what Trump 2.0 would be other than a lamer version with more grievance and an older, less interesting Trump. Uh, yeah. And I think he feels that. But we'll see. The midterms, again, will set his temperature. Yeah. Um, and, and not just the voting in the midterms, but honestly, the crowd sizes. All that. The, right, the way right. he views the world. Uh, if if he's getting 10 and 20,000 people turning out to see him, then the actual election returns won't matter. And yeah, if he's he struggling just, to draw a crowd, then then I think, you know, that that might scare him. Yeah, he needs to feel like a flop and a dud. And and one thing that will work, I think, and I'm sure is a massive frustration to him, there's some tells, is he doesn't have Twitter and Facebook anymore. And when he try, started his blog, you know, literally smallenginerepair.com was getting much bigger traffic. Uh, so he is, you know, he's looking a little bit faded, has been he, and the more that increases, uh, the less I think he'll he'll want to take the risk. Yeah. Uh, all right. So listen, I, this is great. I've, I've enjoyed our conversation, but I want to talk a little bit about Hollywood since I have sure. you and you're out in Hollywood. And when we were talking, I'm a dues paying member of two unions out here. Can you believe it? You're Both a union mandatory. guy now. Oh, I love Writers it. Writers Guild of America West. And of course, a SAG AFTRA. So we were talking in the pre-show uh, and you mentioned an actor who is one of my favorites. Uh, and of, I, when you said his name, I realized I've been saying his name wrong for like Well, I'm not sure years. I am either. In fact, he teased me about that. But So uh, David Strathairn or Strathairn or Strathairn? Like, I've what, been saying Strathairn, but um, let's call him David the Great Actor and a wonderful human being too. So you, uh, so I, you know, I, I wrote a giant John Sayles appreciation piece for uh, for the old the old magazine once upon a time, and I watched you know from Return of the Sea Caucus Seven through Alligator and uh, Eight Men Out and all the stuff, and uh, and that's where I first encountered David Strathairn and his work, and then you know he branched out from Sales and became this indie darling, and then he you know he's all sorts of he's just a great mainstream character. He's been in the the Bourne movies, he's been in uh, L.A. Confidential, and uh, he's what in a no great Mad working Land. actor. He's, he's in, in the, Nomad. Yeah, so yeah. you know, so, and you so tell me all about this guy. He's is a he Zelic is, quality is he movie. Great? Yeah. Well, so I um I wrote and created a. a pilot for CBS about Capitol Hill called Ways and Means starring Patrick Dempsey. And we went out into COVID and shot it and everything. And, and ultimately, it didn't go forward. The Alas, the world of testing, the, you know, political shows uh, and network audiences don't really mix. But it was kind of about the family of the U.S. House. We had a lot of fun doing it. We had a tremendous cast. We had a Holt McCauley, Amanda Warren, Troyan Belisario, Arliss Howard, who's another tremendous actor who's always good. And you've seen him in a lot. If you saw Mank, he was uh, 
uh, Leo Mayer, the studio boss. Um, yeah. and, and David, of course, who we lured to do television because he had liked the original script. And he's wonderful. I'll, I'll give you one, one on set joke. Um, I was asking him about, he was in the, there's this great sci-fi epic, The Expanse, where he shows up and, and I said, that was kind of an interesting project. And he kind of looked at me with a twinkle and I said, yeah, I always wanted to play Long John Silver because <laughs> he does it with this huge <laughs> pirate accent and everything. Uh, but if you're a fan, I will steer you to something that is very near and dear to his heart. Uh, and any Hoyas out there will resonate to this. Uh, that being, of course, the bizarro term for we of Georgetown. There was a legendary professor at Georgetown named Jan Karski, who literally had been a kind of aristocratic family in Poland who snuck into Auschwitz during the war or one of the concentration camps, snuck out and got out of Poland and told the allies about it in the middle of the war. Then he went back, got captured by the Gestapo, tortured, wound up a legendary professor of government and kind of living history at Georgetown. There's a stage play based on his life. If you if you. Google Jan Karski Georgetown stage play and David plays Karski and he is incredible at it. There's kind of a film version. And I think they're trying now that COVID's lifting to put it on the road in Europe. It's kind of a one man show. It, it is a project very close to his heart and it, it is an amazing performance. So I, he was wonderful. Is I asked David him, a Georgetown guy. Uh, no, no. He had just heard the story of Jan Karski, uh, who I had as a professor, and all of us of my year at Georgetown remember him because he was a piece of heroic living history. I think there's a biography out on him now, uh, K-A-R-S-K-I. And, and David was transfixed by the story and kind of brought him to life. And when if you'd had him in a class, watching David play him was kind of like a, a, an amazing experience because he, 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 he totally inhabited him. Um, and so, yeah, it was, uh, and, and he was great. He played, uh, a character we called the liberal lion, uh, who was kind of the conscience of the, uh, of the democratic party and a mentor to Amanda Warren's character who was up and coming, uh, a big fun cast, uh, uh, did it with a guy named Ed Redlick, who, uh, is a dear friend of mine, was an experienced CBS, uh, showrunner. And we, uh, we, we had quite a journey together. So while I'm sad, they didn't order it to series It. uh, it was fun, and, and he was one of a bunch of really, uh, really great actors. Arliss, again, is a hoot. Uh, Damien uh, Young, who is a, a wonderful character actor. You might have seen him. This will be – you're enough of a show business nerd. Remember uh, uh, the um, the comeback, the HBO show about the sitcom yeah. actress? Yeah, he played her husband, and he was a great waspy character named Pancho Wells, who was the rules chairman and kind of the sidekick to uh, – Patrick Dempsey, who actually played the Republican whip. So anyway, we had a That's lot of fun funny. with that. And, and, and David, uh, David, David was just incredible. And it was a pleasure to get to know him and hang out. So this is great. So now the COVID is done. Are you out lunching at the Ivy and, you know, yeah, taking yeah, I meetings have a purple over Ferrari I drive up yeah. on, I've got a Wallace Berry wrestling picture coming up. No, no, I've got a couple of projects going on. I, uh, uh, I can't announce a couple of them, but I, I wrote a movie that seems to be coming to life, which is kind of fun. I wrote it for HBO and then we got it uh, back and I'm partnered up with Leonardo DiCaprio's company, Appian Way on that and the great uh, management and production company, Three Arts. And so we, we've got a we got some great actors lined up. We have a tremendous director and now we're we're slinking around uh, with CAA getting some money to make it. Uh, and then I'm writing something else right now. So yeah, yeah, I, the card carrying member of the evil Hollywood uh, uh, world, right, so and I do it Charlie's on the gonna, side, and I enjoy it. Charlie's going to kill me for turning his show into you know Hollywood Hour. Well, but we I, could I, talk I, watches too, and really scare I everybody because I know you're a watch nerd. <laughs> I am too. So here is here is my you know I will close with a watch thing. But uh, are you and are people out there as freaked out about theatrical exhibition as I have been? Because I have been just ringing, you know, cranking the klaxon sirens since February of 2020, saying this COVID stuff is going to destroy theatrical. Uh, the exhibitor is going to be pushed in bankruptcy. That right. wound up not happening to AMC because AMC became a meme stock, helpfully. So AMC has been sol has been kept solvent by Reddit. 
Yeah. Right. But that the other Which side hopefully is they and they have been they've been turning that that ridiculous bubble hype into cash to maybe save exhibition, at least in the yes. short term. So that's a, a rare rainbow in the which storm is, of madness of the crowds. But yeah, which is good. But the other the other part of this, the part you can't solve is that as the studios consolidate and, you know, we, we've functionally lost two studios, uh, you're going to go from studio, you know, having eight or nine studios pushing out 20 movies a year to five or six studios doing 10 movies a year. And of these, how many are going to be the kind of tentpole mainstream movies that bring people out to buy popcorn in large numbers over the weekends? Did you just have a product shortage? Well, yeah, no, there's concern about it because television in the premium pay for networks or streaming is becoming a place. I mean, you look at the Mandalorian, uh, the the budget per episode on that is behind to the double digit millions, which used to go pay for a Michael Clayton. Uh, so, uh, but yes, there's concern. Now in the creative community, nobody wants to give up the big screens, uh, that experience for people who want them. In the business, remember, it's always show business. There's like, well, we, we have all these great new pipelines to do prestigious stuff. People watch on 50 or 60 inch plasma screens, you know, live with it. The economics are better for mid-level stuff there. But I, I don't I don't think exhibition is over completely. We are a social interacting people. So I think that tentpole world could come back. Uh, but there'd be a shakeout. There's no doubt we're going to have fewer screens. But I, I'm not quite sure I'm ready to bury exhibition. There is a lot of concern. You do want a differentiated experience because uh, you can charge money for it on a big screen with a big tentpole movie. So I think that business model will still be around, but it is going to be reduced because the pandemic just squeezed the death out of the, the exhibitors were all leveraged to begin with. So they weren't yeah. built. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're they had no assets. In the real estate business. Yeah, yeah they're, they're they have no actual physical assets, and the win- the exhibition window has been shrunk now. You know, and that's the real issue, by the way. When, you know, it, that if window you, is going to keep shrinking. That forty five well, days is I, not going to last. There's debate about that. They, uh, you may be right, but there's debate about it because the the extra margin you get is the better big screen experience. If you want to see it on your home screen, you got to pay, but you got to wait. And when they merge them together, they get kind of the fast calories of some revenue. And the thing that lit that on fire is, you know, it's a pandemic because the exhibition model was no longer there. But if it's back, I think the uh, the the people who control the tentpole content will be like, well, wait a minute, let's see, let's go back and see if we can get an average sale of thirty bucks on a big screen rather than squirting it out for four bucks a month on streaming immediately. I think there might be a little counterforce once the exhibition platforms are back. But th- that's the fight. And it'll be the people who pay the bills who figure it out, not me. I'm I'm in the content business. Yeah, no, I, I get it. And believe me, I mean, but at, at root, all of show business is intellectual property business. And the value of intellectual property is generated by theatrical exhibition, not by streaming. I mean, well, the, you know, I'll tell you, the is, biggest thing you, you creatively bump into and what people will tell you in the Hollywood creative community is, you know, it's show business. TV is a business, though, because they need one every week. You right. know, uh, the feature world is a whole nother animal. And what you hear in feature, world, you go pitch them a Michael Clayton now, they will be like, oh, go take that to streaming. Take it to like Netflix. The yep. movie I'm working on, you know, in a, it, it, we, we make it. Uh, my guess is we'll be in the Amazon versus Netflix versus Hulu versus Apple world. Uh, rather than exhibition, because the, what they will tell you in the exhibition world when you pitch it is, well, we don't want a lot of talking because the biggest single market's Asia, uh, particularly China. So let's have giant tractors fight or something. You know, that middle level movie has totally been sp- supplanted into streaming. All right. Uh, so what are, what are you wearing on your wrist right now? One uh, minute. You do one minute of watch talk. OK, Charlie yeah, I, I am wearing a Rolex Sky Dweller in steel. Oh, the Sky Dweller. Yes. Yeah. The uh, the first Rolex perpetual counter. I don't know about first, but the modern one. And uh, yeah, no, no, no. I, I tend to like steel watches, which, of course, are impossible to get. But after 20 years of collecting and, and a little bit of uh, blackmail, I've got a couple of ways to get things now. So I want to I want to authorize dealers. You. No gray market. I want to brag to you about my latest watch. It Tell is, me. It is a Zinn it's German. I know you like oh, the German watches. I do. And it is the Zinn UX, which is Zinn's only quartz watch. 
and I, I am in general not not a quartz guy. I'm a, a mechanical guy. But uh, but the UX was made specially for German special forces, and they're great. It, yep, it is a thermocompensated quartz movement. But the reason it is quartz is because the entire case is filled with oil, and it's the very reason cool. it is filled with oil is to create counter pressure. So this thing is this thing is waterproof to thirteen kilometers. <laughs> Not. Not 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 three thousand me not three thousand meters, which is itself you know astonishing. Not three hundred meters to thirteen kilometers. It is made of tegumented submarine steel, U-boat right, right. stall, which only the Germans truly love. Yep, and it is you know I, I, a friend of mine was like, yeah, so what? So what's so great about this watch? And I was like, my watch sank the Lusitania. That's what's so great about this. Well, you know, when the Trumpers throw you off his yacht and you descend (laughs) into the trench, your skeletal remains will still have, as long as that battery lasts, the the time will be being kept because the oil in the case, as you well know, or in the thing is a counter pressure, so it's not crushed. You know who had a, a, I am a Sin fan, and a million years ago, I gave my then girlfriend, uh, who was cool and funky enough to actually wear it, a Sin Bomb Squad watch. Wow, that's so yeah, cool. Yeah, like 20 years ago. You can probably figure out who it was, and I don't know if she still has the watch, but yep, I've, I've been a Sin that fan for a long time. Wild. All right, Mike, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for hanging out with me and indulging it was me. great. Charlie, Charlie, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for all the things I've just done. Uh, <laughs> hey, Monday, do we have time for astrology or UFOs? We can, <laughs> we can totally hijack this thing here. On Monday, Charlie Sykes will be back in the chair and he'll do this thing all over again. And one fast plug before we oh, say yeah. goodbye. This has been incredibly fun, JVL. Good to talk to you. People subscribe to The Bulwark. It is a indispensable chronicler of our time and a hope for the future. And if you want to hear more of my rambling, Hacks on Tap with me, David Axelrod, and Robert Gibbs every week on Apple Podcasts.